Hi, Joel. Hey, Drew. Good. I'm glad. I. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad my, my stuff is working. Uh, last week I started to present at a national conference and nothing worked because I had to go to my iPad. Yeah. Yep, I hear you fine. There are, there are about seven more people in the waiting room, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait a little closer to the time. I did message all the waiting room people a few minutes ago to let them know. Okay. Uh, Drew, I don't know if you've met Harriet Whiting before. She's the president of our board. I don't think so. Hi, Harriet. Hi, Drew. Hi. And, nice to meet you. And great. Harriet, Drew is the executive director of the Tulsa Jewish Federation and has been a, a wonderful partner in this. And you may Hi. remember him from the uh, from the Community of Conscience series. Uh, he spoke on the I, I do indeed. Yes. Nice to see you again. Thank you. Yeah, this is this is exciting. Joel has uh, really uh, got us all together. And and I don't sure. I don't assume you've seen your email, Drew. But I just sent out uh, a note uh, right before I signed on. I ran a fresh registration report. We're over two hundred people. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? Yes, that's really amazing, Joel. Yeah, I just saw the email. It's uh, super. You know, Zoom just recently changed their settings for security right. purposes. And I kind of, you know, I don't usually, I hadn't, I hadn't typically used the waiting room in the past, but, you know, for, for meetings like this, I, I like it because it gives us kind of a chance to, to touch base first. David, how are you? Hi, Dr. Patterson. Oh, you're muted still. Uh, thank God I'm well. Hello, Drew. Hi. Hi. We're, we're sure pleased you could, you could do this with us tonight. Well, thank you. This it's is, my pleasure. Yeah, this is, this is exciting. Well, I hope- And David, I'm gonna go ahead. I just went ahead and made you a co-host so we don't have to worry about whether or not the settings will allow you to share your screen. You should be able to now. Okay, great. Um, good. Thank you. Yeah. Come here. That's that green. Yeah. Okay. I got it. So how, uh, how's school going? Are y'all still all virtual or are you doing any in-person teaching? Most of us are doing everything online. There are a few classes, but uh, because of the social distancing, we're limited as to how many students can go into a given room. Mm. Uh, I mean, you need a you need a room that'll seat a hundred in order to have twenty five or thirty. You know that so that's a challenge. And, yeah, we yeah. We just took, uh, I, I just spent a week on the road with my daughter visiting different campuses and they're, they're, you know, every campus has their own system in place. But, you know, one of the schools we were at was a, uh, a university of 18,000 students. And I tell you, we did not run into five people the entire time we were there. It was eerie. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of the ones, the students who are doing it online are, are generally not living on campus or not in residence at the campus. Mm -hmm. We have students from all over the world, actually, who, who are, of course, taking classes at all hours of their day and night with the time zone differences. So it looks like we'll be doing this next semester as well. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, we okay. haven't... We haven't yet said what we're going to do after uh, January 1st, but I, I can't imagine we'll be going right back into the swing of things then. Angela, hi, I'm Joel Schweitzer. I'm the regional director for AJC. You're muted, uh, by the way. Hi. 
Sorry, nice to meet you. You too. Thanks for joining us. Um, uh, and and David Angela is the one who's going to be introducing you this evening. Hi, Angela. How are you doing? Hi, Dr. Patterson. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. It's uh, please call me David. <laughs> Thank you, David. It's fine. <laughs> David, is Geraldine Patterson a relation of yours? Should I let her in? She's my wife. Well, then I'm going to let her in. If that's okay. <laughs> let her in. I mean, it's, you know. Yes. Of course, she's heard me before. <laughs> and yet she still comes. That's and, a good sign. She's... So it looks like you have a decent uh, number of participants. Yeah, it, it does. We, and we've got over 200 people signed up for the series. Of course, I, I don't think we'll get that many at any one session, but it's very, very encouraging that we have uh, uh, that many registered. Oh, that's excellent. That's excellent. <laughs> well, you've done a good job promoting it. Well, I can't take any credit. That's all Drew and, and Charlotte and all the, all the Tulsa-based people. They've done an incredible job beating the bushes. Well, the Ackerman Center is certainly very happy to, to work with you. Yeah. It's always been a good partnership. You know, David, uh, way back a million years ago last fall, we uh, we tried to get together for coffee. I I hope we can remember to the to the day soon where that can actually happen. Yes, yes, I remember that. We will. I know life will return to normal. It, it normal may look a little bit different, but it will return to normal. Yeah. I just sent everyone in the waiting room a message letting them know I'm gonna I'm gonna clear the waiting room in about two minutes. Okay. Great. And then once we always oh, see Niels is in the uh, in the waiting room, I'll let him in. And then once we do that, we uh, you know give people another couple of minutes to arrive. And then at, at seven o two, Drew, you can uh, you can go okay. ahead and get the ball rolling. Hey David, good to see you. Hey, you Joel. too, Nils. I see Sandy. How you doing, Sandy? Hello. How are y'all? Pleasure as always. It's always good to be with our friends from the Ackerman Center. Same here. Same here. I like your setup. You know, this looks impressive, Joel. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> this was this was from a program we did at uh, at the Meadows Museum uh, about a year and a half ago. Very nice setup. Um, no. This, yeah, the long list of registrations. So you'll be a popular man tonight, David. Yeah. Not just tonight, of course, but tonight as well. But you know. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm padding it with my students. Oh, I see. This is we we normally one of them is our... here taking notes. Yeah. Ah, that's right. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give it about another 30 seconds and then we will uh, start letting the waiting room folks in. Mm -hmm. It looks like there are 50 people in the waiting room right now. Oh, wow. Wonderful. Yeah, we should, yeah, they should pay entrance, you know. <laughs> you should pay your speakers. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Especially tonight. I, I'm sure that uh, when you make it up to Tulsa, Drew would be happy to take you to dinner. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I know a couple of fast food places that are pretty good. <laughs> oh, I heard you opened up a wonderful museum. Yes, we do. And we concurrently, this is the week that we're opening up our new uh, gallery, which is our new... Uh, That's what I heard. Holly, Holly Maori was up visiting with you. I'm gonna I'm gonna let everyone in now. All right, then we'll mute and good luck, David. Thank you.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We will get started in just a couple of minutes. We'll give other people a chance to arrive. They're still, uh, they're still arriving about as, uh, as fast as I can let them in. And I've got seven o'clock on the dot right now, and, and at 7.02, uh, I'll let Drew get the show on the road. Such a pleasure to see everyone this evening. It's nice to see different faces in the little boxes on my screen from the ones I'm used to. There's Drew. Right Just having trouble connecting. Do we have everybody seated? We just hit the century mark in attendance. That's great. All right, Drew, I'm going to hand it off to you and uh, let's get this started. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this, is, this is exciting. This is our, our kickoff of our uh, four part series, The Rise of Anti Semitism in Turbulent Times. I want to welcome you all and, uh, you know, sit back and relax and we, we will get started. Before we get started, though, a uh, couple people to thank. I want to thank, I uh, would like to thank uh, Charlotte Schumann, uh, who, who brought together uh, the Jewish Federation of Tulsa, uh, my organization, uh, the Ackerman Center, and AJC. Uh, without Charlotte uh, uh, kind of getting us all together over the past year and a half or so, uh, these kind of events uh, would probably not be possible. And before we get too far, I want to thank Joel uh, from uh, AJC for uh, shepherding us through this, uh, uh, through this uh, uh, virtual process. Uh, before we get started, I do want to say a few things about the Ackerman Center. Uh, it's been our pleasure from the Jewish Federation of Tulsa and the Sherwin Miller Museum of Jewish Art for us uh, to have a partnership with the Ackerman Center. Uh, the, the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies is at the University of Texas at Dallas and is the only academic program in the country that offers a PhD with a multidisciplinary curriculum of Holocaust human rights and genocide studies for what, what is a very diverse student body. 
uh, the students at the Ackerman Center carry out the Ackerman mission uh, through their lives as educators and their professional lives and as leaders, and not only in America, but around the world. Um, with, with the center, and as Joe will, will give you a brief on, 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 uh, on the AJC, uh, this makes, uh, this kind of partners makes this kind of event possible. Uh, Joel? Thank you, Drew, and uh, really would like to, to thank uh, you and all the staff we've worked with at the Tulsa Jewish Federation, Nancy and Alex in particular, uh, for your partnership. And of course, we've, we've done a number of things over the years with uh, the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies, and we're just always pleased to have the opportunity to partner together with them. I know that many of you uh, may not be very familiar with AJC, and I'm not going to do a deep dive right now, but just very quickly, we are known as the State Department of the Jewish People. Uh, it was uh, actually Shimon Perez who coined that, uh, that phrase. We do a lot in the area of international diplomacy on behalf of the Jewish people. We also do a lot of coalition building uh, with people of different ethnic groups, different faiths, and develop relationships with uh, religious, ethnic, and civic leaders on a, uh, on a local, national, and global, uh, and global level. Um, we have been, since, uh, since 1906, the leading global Jewish advocacy organization, and, and we specialize in advocacy and human relations. Uh, I, I would also like to welcome my assistant director, Amy Berger, is with us tonight. Also, uh, the president of, of my board, Harriet Whiting, uh, and, and in addition to uh, Charlotte, who serves on our, on our board, I'd also like to recognize Judith Lipson, who I believe is with us uh, tonight. We will, uh, you know, as Drew said, have the opportunity to hear uh, four sessions, two featuring Ackerman Center speakers and two AJC speakers. Uh, tonight we'll be hearing from Dr. Patterson on uh, what history can teach us, patterns of anti-Semitism. Next week we'll be covering uh, the impact of nationalism on anti-Semitism, the Holocaust and other events, featuring Dr. Niels Romer, who's also with us this evening. On Thursday the 29th, my colleague Holly Huffnagel, who is AJC's U.S. Director of Combating Anti-Semitism, will uh, we'll join us and talk about anti-Semitism in the digital age. And finally, we will close with two speakers, my colleagues, Rabbi Andrew Baker, who is AJC's Director of International Jewish Affairs, and Sefi Kogan, AJC's Global Director of Young Leadership. And they will be discussing Israel and anti-Semitism, uh, specifically uh, about the BDS movement and uh, Rabbi Baker more from an international perspective and Sefi uh, more from the campus view. Uh, so we'll look forward to, to four great sessions with those, uh, with those speakers. Um, one final housekeeping note, I find in meetings and programs like this, it often is beneficial for me personally to toggle back and forth between the gallery view and the speaker view. That way I get the sense of being in a large community in the gallery view. And then uh, also from time to time get to really focus on that speaker. You can find the button in the, uh, in the upper right corner that will let you switch between the gallery view and the speaker view. And just a recommendation, uh, uh, you know, take it, take it or leave it if you like. And, and with that, it is my great pleasure to turn it over to Angela Taubman to introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you, Joel. Welcome and good evening. It is my honor to introduce our speaker for tonight's lecture in this series. Dr. David Patterson is the Hillel A. Feinberg Distinguished Chair in Holocaust Studies at the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies of the University of Texas at Dallas. He is a member of the World Union of Jewish Studies and the Association for Jewish Studies. Dr. Patterson is a consultant to many national organizations, including the Philadelphia Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and has delivered lectures at numerous universities and national community organizations throughout the world. 
a winner of the National Jewish Book Award and the Coret Jewish Book Award, Dr. Patterson has published more than 35 books and 150 articles in the area of philosophy, literature, Judaism, Holocaust, and education. He serves as co-editor-in-chief for the Stephen S. Weinstein series in post-Holocaust studies, published by the University of Washington Press. Dr. Patterson is the editor and translator of the English edition of the Complete Black Book of Russian Jewry and is a major contributor and co-editor of the Encyclopedia of Holocaust Literature, as well as co-editor of Fire in the Ashes, God, Evil, and the Holocaust, and afterwards, Post-Holocaust Struggles with Forgiveness, Reconciliation, and Justice. In his spare time, Dr. Patterson has also translated literary works by Turgenev, Dostoevsky, and Tolstoy. His most recent book is entitled Genocide in Jewish Thought. With that, I now turn the platform over to our distinguished speaker, Dr. David Patterson, for what I know will be an engaging discussion this evening. Thank you so much, uh, Angela. Thank you, Joel and Drew. I want to say hello to Charlotte and uh, welcome my students who, uh, who, who are patient enough to uh, come and listen to this uh, presentation. Um, I'll have them for you know, much later in the evening than, than we'll have here. Um, but this is, this is my topic. what history can teach us about patterns of anti-Semitism. Um, anti-Semitism has been called the longest hatred. Um, it's one of the, one of, one of the most uh, confounding phenomena in, in human history. We have uh, this kind of iconic image the eternal Jew. This is from Nazi propaganda, Nazi propaganda film. But the, the term eternal places the Jew in a category that, that goes beyond the world. It's not that uh, all Jews are evil, but rather all evil is Jewish. The evil, the contagion, the threat that hangs over the world is from the Jews. Um, so it's not an ethnic prejudice. Uh, Judaism is not a form of racism. Racism rather is a form of, I mean, anti-Semitism is not a form of racism. Racism is rather a form of anti-Semitism. Um, the, the manifestation, <clears throat> the phenomenon of contempt for the Jews uh, precedes Christianity. Uh, you can find it in the pagan world and fit in like in the Greek philosopher Democritus, um, Roman historian Tacitus, but it's really with the advent of the Christian period that the, the hatred and contempt of the Jews takes on a, what I call a metaphysical or a theological dimension. With the Greeks and the Romans, it was, uh, basically an ethnic prejudice. Um, so you have this, you know, this beginning with uh, figures like St. Ignatius of Antioch in the first century and going into the early second century. And there's a history of uh, unfolding of the, of the Jew as a theological category. So it begins with the, the issues between early Christians and Jews, uh, the question of do you have to be a, a Jew to be a Christian? Um, this is an argument between Paul and James, who is the head of the Jerusalem church. And uh, St. Ignatius contributed to that split. Um, the, the, as the Bishop of Antioch, he, he determined that the commandments of the Jews, which are from the Torah, should not be observed. And so soon after, as you go into the second century, you have uh, supersessionism coming in in a, in a really uh, 
sophisticated way. And you'll notice, at least from the second century, <laughs> many of the images of the, of the church fathers will show them holding a book. And this will become important as I go on. Note the book. Um, when the new comes in, the old is done away with. The old is not just uh, outdated, it's moribund. It's not just moribund, it's threatening. Um, it's contaminating. New comes in like a new birth. Without, without the new that's being referred to here, which would become the New Testament, the New Covenant, there's no life. Um, so subsequently, going into the second and third centuries, uh, you have the, the Saints Tertullian, Justin Martyr, Origen, Cyprian, up to, just to name a few, and, and one of the themes that run through their writings are the teaching of contempt, and uh, the Jews as deicides, as the murderers of God. This is this already you can see takes anti-Semitism as I'm I'm using the term to to refer to Jew hatred throughout history, it takes anti-Semitism into again a theological category. Uh, it's part of a cosmological worldview. It's part of how we understand God and world and humanity. Okay, so the teaching of contempt, uh, the adversos judeos, as it was called, is, is a contempt not just for uh, what an inferior uh, race or ethnic group or anything like that. It's a contempt for false teaching, which threatens the life of the soul, which threatens the life of God himself. It's a teaching that would destroy God. Um, and so you can see who would want to destroy God. But a, a satanic people. Uh, who, can, who can even think about going to war with God? Um, it's, it's the devil. So the, the ceremonies of the Jews, says St. Jerome, uh, the, the, the man who translated the Bible into Latin, uh, are pernicious and deadly. Whoever has fallen into the pit of the devil not just fallen into, you know, the, the, a wrong path or a mistaken path. It's not like being taken over by the wrong political party or something like that. Um, it's it's, it's the, the pit of the devil and St. John Chrysostom was one of the uh, most vicious here. He was a, a contemporary of, of St. Jerome. Um, where he situates the synagogue, you know, in the category of the pit of Satan, whoever, it's the devil who, who leads them in their revels, not in their davening and their praying, but in their revels, okay. And uh, this comes at the end of the fourth century, uh, when in 385, Christianity becomes the official religion of Rome, okay. It becomes a tolerated religion in 325 uh, with uh, Emperor Constantine and then the official religion. So it's, it's the religion of the state. Um, so it, it finds its, itself into the code of law. Okay, so it's not, the, the anti-Semitism is not only uh, given a theological ground, it's, it's made licit or legal, legally required, so to say. It's not only religiously required, it's politically required with the Code of Justinian as it develops. Now, meanwhile, um, on the Arabian Peninsula, you have uh, similar anti-Semitic tropes creeping in. Um, and once again, note this in this portrait of Muhammad, note the book. Note the book. And you'll find passages like this. Of course, the Quran has uh, some passages favorable toward the Jews, some not so favorable. Um, it's said that when the, Maju when the Jews rejected Muhammad, uh, he, his wrath, you know, went against them, and that's where you you begin to find passages like this. Uh, 
you know, the Jews are those upon whom the, the wrath of Allah has fallen. And so in, uh, so you have in these, in the years from between 624 and 628, I mean, you recall Muhammad died in 632. Um, the slaughter of, of, of a tribe of Jews known as Bana, Banu Qurayza, and the expulsion of two other Jewish tribes, the Banu Nadir and Banu Kanuka. Um, this is an image from, you know, the, the art of the period of the, the, the killing and the expulsion of those Jews. Um, parallel to the Code of Justinian. I mean, after the, the theological uh, I would say demonization or ostracizing, uh, you, know, you know, casting out the Jews. You have the uh, Jews being defined under the law. And this will come, this will repeat itself later in things like Nuremberg codes, you know. What is the, what is the status of the Jew under the law? And, and, you, and you have this early on. You have this early on with the Pact of Umar, um, in the seventh century, he was, he was a contemporary of Muhammad. They would unfold in other packs uh, with things like the Demi status of the Jew, um, other persecutions of the Jews uh, at the hands of uh, Islam. I mean, sometimes it's thought, well, the Jews and the Muslims got along. That's not always the case. There are many examples of the slaughter of Jews at the hands of Muslims, particularly in North Africa and Southern Spain. Okay, this is the, the, the Granada massacre of 1066, uh, the massacre of the Jews at the hands of the Muslims is, is one of the more famous ones. Um, even Tumart of Morocco, this is a, this is a, uh, a purist figure. Uh, even Tumart incited the, what would become the Almohad Rebellion uh, based in Morocco, but spread over North Africa and went into Spain. The, it was a rebellion against the existing uh, Muslim rulers to purify Islam, okay? It's a purist movement. And seeking purity will be will be part of the pattern of anti-Semitism, okay? You'll find, we, we, uh, you have the, the Nazis interested in purity of blood, you got the Inquisition, Limpieza de Sangre, um, the idea that the Jews carry contagion, that they're in, in the blood. Uh, the Nazi ideologue, Alfred Rosenberg, has said, once said that the, 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 con the contagion of Judaism is in the blood of every Jew. That's why every, that's why every Jew has to be exterminated, not just the religious ones, okay? Because they're all carriers of the disease of the impurity. And uh, so the, the, there was, uh, for several decades, um, the, the Amohad persecutions of of the Jews and, uh, well, and non-Muslims, but in, in certainly including the Jews, uh, extended over this region between 1147 and 12, 12, well, into 1269, but the worst period was in the middle there. At the same time, in uh, Christian Europe, you have famously the Fourth Lateran Council um, the Fourth Lateran Council implemented several uh, sanctions against the Jews, such as wearing identifying badges or marks on their clothing, something that the Muslims had already implemented several centuries before. Um, restricting the movement of Jews, professions of Jews. Um, it's also at this time that, that uh, the Dominican Order, for example, was founded in order to proselytize the Jews. So uh, the Jews, it's at least in principle at this time, were not to be exterminated, but uh, were certainly to be converted if at all possible. 
Um, it's also at the Fourth Lateran Council that the doctrine of transubstantiation became official. That is, that the, the, the wafers and the wine are actually transubstantiate, I mean, transform into the flesh and the blood of the Christ at the Eucharist. And this will also become significant. Um, in this century, this of course is, comes uh, near the end of the Crusades. There, there were nine major Crusades um, from 1096 to about 1272. And uh, the Jews suffered greatly during the Crusades, as did the Muslims. And when, when the Crusaders got to Jerusalem, it said, uh, the chroniclers say that uh, their horses were knee deep in blood. Uh, the, in the blood of the Muslims, the, of the what the Crusaders are calling the infidels, but uh, of course, on their way, it's in the Rhineland. Uh, there's you know infamous massacres of the Jews. Um, it's in this century, then the 13th century, that you have uh, really the first public and systematic burnings of the Talmud, with the sanction of of the Pope himself, Pope Gregory the Ninth. And this was incited by a Jewish convert to Christianity uh, named Nicholas Donan, interestingly. I mean, the Jewish converts to Christianity were often the most sev severe persecutors of the Jews. This is also, remember, that's after the doctrine of transubstantiation becomes official in 1215, you start having accusations of the, the desecration of the host namely that the Jews would steal or the, uh, the, the wafers used in the Eucharist ceremony and reenact the crucifixion. And it's all, I mean, it was said that the wafers would bleed. So the Jews know exactly what they're doing. They know they're going to shed the blood of God when they crucify these wafers. Right. Um, it's also at this time that you have um, this, this uh, crime of deicide, you know, with the crime of, uh, of uh, desecration of the host, it's associated with deicide. It becomes associated also with the blood libel. Blood will be very significant here as, as, uh, among the patterns of anti-Semitism. Um, Thomas Aquinas, the most prominent Catholic theologian still, I mean, there, I mean Thomism is still uh, a very part, big part, very big uh, line in, in Catholic thinking. It's not the only line by far, but it's very big. And notice the statement that they cannot claim ignorance. They know what they're doing. They know Jesus the Christ is the Messiah. They know better than anyone how to recognize the Messiah. They wrote the book, so to say, on how you recognize the Messiah. Who is the Messiah? Where does the Messiah come from? So who would consciously and conscientiously reject the salvation that comes with the Messiah, but someone who is demonic, right? Um, so... You, you see the, the medieval, in the med medieval art from the period, you see the Jews being depicted more and more like something monstrous, something satanic, and certainly not like Jesus, who incidentally was Jewish, right? He doesn't look like the Jews who are bringing him to the, 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 the priest Caiaphas. Um, these are all, you know, the Jews are, are evil. Um, from 1144 on, the blood libel starts to, to, to come into play, gaining momentum. It doesn't ever go away. It hasn't gone away yet. It has not gone away yet. In fact, in the 19th century, there were more documented cases of blood libel than in the previous centuries combined. Um, this is another infamous series of massacres, Rindfleisch massacres which revolved largely around blood libel in, uh, in Germany, in what is now Germany. And notice the, the flames, it's, it's fire that purifies. 
It's fire that purifies. And of course, the, the uh, slaying of children in order to use their blood in, in matzah and other rituals is a reenactment of creation. Uh, the, the taking the blood is taking the soul, taking the life. The Jew, like Satan, preys on the soul. Um, you have similar uh, widespread burnings of Jews during the Black Death of 1349 and 1350, in those years when uh, Europe was decimated. Um, and the Jews were not dying at, at quite the rate of the Christians. As you know, the Jews have very specific laws about washing, uh, washing your hands. We're told, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands during the COVID. Uh, the Jews are required to wash their hands before they eat, after they answer the call of nature, before they handle holy books, um, for the, you know, purifying themselves for the Sabbath and so on. So they weren't dying at the rate of, uh, that the non-Jews were. Um, so you have, you know, again, increasingly the, the association of the Jews with Satan and notice in this image from the 15th century, you have that Satan himself is wearing the, that circle on his cloak is the Jew badge. Um, the Jews are, his, are the minions of Satan who is like the chief Jew, so to say. And uh, you see one, the evidence of their most heinous evil above in the, in the image of blood libel and crucifixion. Now, in order to purify the, the body of Christ, the church, later it would be the body politic, right? When it wasn't conversion, but assimilation became the issue, purifying the body politic. The Jew is an alien presence in the body politic. It's the 19th and 20th century. Um, over the centuries in Christendom, the Jew was a, not just an alien presence, but an evil presence. So the Jews were expelled from virtually every, every place they lived at one point or another. This is you know, a map of the expulsions of Jews just uh, from 1016 to 1497 with, with the uh, expulsion from Portugal. Um, Spanish Inquisition, I mentioned limpieza de sangre, purity of blood. Now, what is the, 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 the mission of the Spanish Inquisition was to root out heresy. Heresy is false belief. It's not just mistaken belief. It's belief that, is, that threatens the life of the soul because the life of the soul in a creed-based tradition rests upon correct belief, okay? The, the, uh, the Council of Nicaea was convened in 325, largely to establish what is correct belief and to identify heresy. What threatens the life of the soul? Okay. The heresy that had to be expunged was Judaizing. Judaizing. And like something on the order of 97, 98% of the heretics burned at the stake in the time of the Spanish Inquisition were Jews. And most of them were Jews who had converted to Christianity, right? We're gonna find out how much you love Jesus, okay? Um, because the, of this purity of blood, that's the, the contamination of Judaism is still in there. After all, I saw this guy lighting candles on Friday, or his wife. Uh, we have to root that out. Um, so you have, you know, portrayals of heretics will almost always be, from this time, portrayals of Jews. You see the, the pointed hats. Those are Jewish hats. Jews had to wear hats like that. Um, you might wonder, well, uh, did this get any better with the Reformation and the advent of Martin Luther? Short answer is no. Um, in 1543, 
Three years before his death, Luther wrote a, a work called On the Jews and Their Lies, uh, which is called for putting Jews into labor camps, called for making uh, Torah study punish, uh, you know, punishable by death, and with statements like this, if they, if they could, they would kill 10 more. Um, as you, we move into the modern period, um, the Jew still becomes a cosmological figure, a figure that threatens uh, not just a given society, but all of humanity, all of humanity. Um, it, Hitler says in Mein Kampf that if we should lose the war against the Jews, the result will mean the funeral wreath of humanity. And this, you do, so you have figures not like uh, the Rothschild here, who, uh, who, who was greedily clutching the gro globe. The Rothschild family, as you know, is a German family from the 18th century who, that made a great deal of wealth in banking and their, and their descendants as well. Um, the threat over the globe finds its, uh, you know, its, its, its expression in various motifs uh, and propaganda on the left. This, you have an image from Nazi propaganda on the right, this is the, the cover of an Arabic language edition of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which I'll mention again shortly. And so they become, the Jew becomes the invisible wire puller, threatening the world, hanging over the world. You can't see him. You can't see, he's as, as invisible as Satan. You can't see, you, you can't see the contagion but it is deadly. So notice that the, there are key concepts here. These, these, this is the pattern, the word, blood, and redemption. The, the anti-Semite has to appropriate the word, has to take on, a, assume a supersessionist word. Uh, the Latin Vulgate is not just a translation of the Hebrew Bible, it's an appropriation of the Hebrew Bible. The, the Catholics didn't study the Hebrew Bible, with the exception of some of the you know, rare scholars. The Quran states that the Jews falsify the word. This is the true word. Modern biblical scholarship in treating uh, the, the holy word as a uh, you know, quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore is a way of displacing the authority of that word. Uh, the Nazis burned Hebrew Bibles not, not Bibles translated into German, no, that's, those are fine. Anything in Hebrew, the Hebrew word was subject to obliteration. Uh, and, and in subsequent times, the protocols of the elders of Zion, uh, supposedly minutes taken in secret meetings of Jews, Jewish elders plotting to take over the world. This gets quoted throughout anti-Semitic literature, including the, the, the Hamas Charter. The Hamas Charter quotes three sources to justify the truth of what it says. One is the Quran, the other is the Hadith, the collections of writings of teachings of Muhammad, and the third is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Okay. Um, it, this originally published in, in uh, the, the Russian periodical Znamya, uh, probably compiled between 1897-98, um, by a Russian named Rachkovsky and subsequently disseminated by uh, a Russian uh, secret police official known as Nilus. It became uh, widely circulated, after, especially after the First World War, which uh, is a story unto itself. Uh, the blood libel, blood, I've said, the, so the word is part of the patterns, appropriating the word, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the teaching, the authority of the word, the word of law, and so on, the blood, the life that's in the blood, the purity of blood, the uh, shedding of blood also becomes a motif. Here you have the blood libel from, uh, Simon, this is a picture of Simon of Trent, famous blood libel case from the 15th century. This one on the upper right is from uh, Der Sturmer, the Nazi propaganda. On the lower left, you have an image from 
uh, the Arab Muslim world. And on the lower right, this is a scene from a Syrian production broadcast over Al Manar satellite, uh, which is a Hezbollah broadcasting facility, a dramatization of the blood libel. Um, if you thought this was something of the past, here's, a, here's an image of the, the martyrdom of Simon of Trent, blood libel from about five years after his death. And here's a painting from this year. Uh, from, from the famous Italian painter, that's Gasparani. So, and, and notice, rats, I'm sorry. Notice that, uh, notice this, this, the wound in the side of the child, Simon. This is, he's in a cruciform position. Jesus, uh, Jesus was wounded in the side, water flowed from the wound, and of course the Jews look a lot like Hasidim here, not like 15th century Jews. So the blood libel continues. The blood of uh, Mustafa Tlas, a Syrian uh, defense minister, wrote a book called The Matzah of Zion, promoting the blood libel. Uh, Omar Barghouti, founder of the BDS movement, has claimed that Israeli soldiers go out at night to hunt children. To hunt children. This is a form of blood libel. Um, and then finally, the issue of redemption. And I'll just be like two more minutes. Um, the Jew threatens the project of redemption. And the anti-Semite uh, holds out the promise of redemption, redemption in as much as an anti-Semite opposes the Jew. Now, this statement is not necessarily anti-Semitic, but it would, become, it would become that as soon as Judaizing became known as false belief or heresy. And I mentioned the Nicene Creed, which, you know, early on defines heresy. This is at the time when the Jews are being demonized by the church fathers, not just criticized for false belief, but demonized because they threaten re the, the life of the soul. They threaten the redemption of humanity. Um, Islam is also creed-based. Um, those who believe and do right will have gardens of paradise as a gift, but that belief is really critical here. And the fundamental belief is, of course, the shahada, uh, that uh, there's no, no God but Allah and, and uh, Muhammad is his prophet. This is on the Saudi flag. And uh, the sword is there to enforce the belief, to spread the belief, not just enforce it. Notice uh, this in this passage from the Hadith, the, the, the relation between redemptive anti-Semitism and eschatology, the last days, when, uh, you know, the, the day of judgment won't come until the Muslims fight the Jews and kill the Jews, and the Jews will hide behind trees and stones, and the trees and stones themselves will cry out, come and kill this Jew. Or the nature itself will vomit up the Jew to purify, to purify itself and thus be redeemed. Um, redemption comes with killing the Jew. Now, it's during the Crusades. You have priests who are saying anyone who kills a Jew will have his sins forgiven, but you, the, the other priests are saying, no, 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 that's not true. That's not how it works. Nevertheless, it, 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 it existed. And similarly, Haj Amina Husseini, the Nazi war criminal, uh, in uh, Arabic language, Nazi propaganda broadcast preached that whoever kills a Jew is assured a place in the next world. Al Husseini, of course, was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. What about the secular forms of anti-Semitism? The, 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 here, um, these four figures are uh, Marx, of course, Marxist, communist, Fourier, Toussaint, Proudhon, famous socialists. All of them were atheists, but all of them had, uh, you know, espoused an ideology that promised a utopian future. So, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, a redemptive, a redeemed world, basically. And all of them 
wrote diatribes against the Jews. So here, these are some familiar faces. I don't even have to tell you who they are, but it's purity, power, and redemption. Purity and power lead to redemption, whether it's religious or secular, wherever you see anti-Semitism. So that's the pattern. That's the pattern. Uh, and that's what's eternal about the Jew, the eternal Jew. Thanks so much. I have a qu couple of questions from the audience so far, and, and I would encourage others, if you uh, would like to ask a question, you can either type your question in and I can uh, read it from the chat, or you can just say, you know, I have a question and I can call on you and you can unmute yourself. Uh, the first question from, uh, from James, uh, he's interested in knowing if you see a through line in the types of blood libels that uh, happened historically to today uh, with things like we see from the QAnon movement, like the Save the Children movement and, and other, uh, other anti-Semitic tropes that we're seeing out of, uh, out of QAnon. Well, the blood, yeah, the blood libel is always tied to children. Uh, the ch children represent innocence, purity, future, and, and uh, that's what the Jew threatens, purity, innocence, future. The redemp that's part, it's, you know, it's part of redemptive anti-Semitism. Anti if you look at jihadist propaganda images, uh, you'll see ba a baby carriage very often in, somewhere in the image. Uh, the the children are yeah are are, re, are recurring motif. It's not it's not that they take an adult and kill him or her. It's the child, uh, and the child in, is the unblemished lamb. Uh, the child is our hope for the hope for our future. The the reason why we live, right? Those of us who have children know this very well. So yeah, it's I mean it, it shows up in lots of lots of different ways, but it's still it's ongoing, it's in the soul, so to say. It's not confined to a historical period. It's eternal. Eternal anti-Semitism is eternal. Thank you for uh, for that insight. Mary Cantrell asks, to what extent? have Catholics and Muslims acknowledged and apologized for the history of anti-Semitism inherent in their religions? To what extent? Uh, some have, some haven't. Um, the, to, to the extent that it, that it has become a matter of reckoning for Catholics and Muslims, it's a, it's a post-Holocaust phenomenon. Um, or certainly, it's, you know, you see the, the, the first written documents from Christians re, trying to come to terms with the history of anti-Semitism and the history of Christianity in uh, the 1920s and 30s. Uh, James Parks is one, uh, Jacques Maritain, Catholic theologian in France in the 30s wrote about this. Um, but it, it's for, certainly for Christians, it's come about post-Holocaust. It's, it's, it's part of Jewish-Christian dialogue, which is itself a post-Holocaust phenomenon. Um, in the case of uh, Islam, there, there are very few Muslim scholars who try to come to terms with it. I personally know a couple um, but they take great risks to even suggest that there's anything wrong with the Hadith, for example, or with any passage in the Quran. Um, of course, if, if the Quran, like, like, the, like any other scripture, can, can be cherry-picked to suit whatever agenda you're trying to promote, right? Um, if you want to promote a, a non submit non-anti-Semitic, you know, outlook, you can find those verses too. Um, so I think, I think the anti-Semitism 
guides the reading of the text and, and not the text is guiding the anti-Semitism. That's, that's important insight. If I can uh, add a little moderator's discretion and, and give a little background uh, because AJC has been involved in a lot of interreligious diplomacy between both the Catholic and the Muslim communities. So of course in 1965, Vatican II uh, led to a, uh, the release of the Nostra Aetate doctrine in which Jews were no longer to be actively sought for conversion and Jews were no longer to be held collectively responsible for, right. uh, for uh, the death of Jesus. And, and so uh, the Catholic religion has done, has done quite a bit in this area. We have done, uh, just in the last several years, AJC has, uh, has built a department of US Muslim Jewish relations and has actually expanded a lot of our uh, interreligious advocacy and diplomacy to uh, international Muslim uh, communities as well. And we had uh, at, our, at our international uh, conference in Jerusalem two years ago, uh, the head of the largest Muslim uh, organization in the world uh, out of Indonesia came to Jerusalem and spoke to a Jewish audience uh, at our global forum. So you talk about taking great risks and that was certainly a great risk. We Yes. Yes, <clears throat> there's more activity like that. In January of this year, we took a delegation of leaders to, uh, through the Muslim World League, we signed a, a, mem a memorandum of understanding with the Muslim World League last year. And this year in January brought a delegation of senior Muslim and Jewish leaders to Auschwitz uh, and, uh, and, and you know, the, the reconciliation between the, uh, the Jewish and Muslim communities is, you know, there, there's a lot of good work being done and, you know, would love if people are interested after, uh, you know, offline, I can share more information about some of the work that's been done in that area. Yeah, it's not, and it's the, inst the Institute for the Global Study of Antisemitism and Policy, ISCAP, is also doing more and more work with uh, Muslim organizations to, d to deal with the problem of anti-Semitism uh, that, that is current and ongoing and not so much with the history within various traditions, but you know, what are we gonna do with it now? But if you don't know the history, you, you, don't, you have no idea what you're dealing with now. I mean, the, the patterns, that's where the patterns unfold, right? David, we, we hear a lot the term the new anti-Semitism. I, I remember hearing it a lot 20 years ago uh, and, and certainly in the last several years as well, but is there really a new anti-Semitism? Can you compare and contrast what we're seeing today with the more historic strains of anti-Semitism? Well, you, the, I, I think the, the patterns remain the same, but the manifestation shifts. Uh, there's there's, it, it, there's something protean about it, you know, shape shifting. Um, the the anti anti semitism uh, becomes more dangerous as it becomes more acceptable, right? So the so called new anti semitism is 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 a form of anti semitism that finds acceptable forms of expression. And I would say one you know, wide, widespread form of that is anti-Zionism. So that the delegitimization and demonization of the Jewish state becomes the, you know, the new so-called new anti-Semitism, but it's driven by an ancient, the ancient uh, currents and, and, and tropes. Um, it's new because the Jewish state is new. Right. It's so uh, the Jewish state becomes the Jew among the nations, and in in uh, in many quarters, uh, anti-Zionism is not only acceptable; it's it's morally required, but which is also a uh, part of an ancient pattern. Right. And anti-Semitism spreads 
where it becomes a moral imperative, when, where, where it becomes part of a project of redemption, right, and purification. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, the new anti-Semitism shows itself in relation in the discourse surrounding the Jewish state where the opposition is not an opposition to the policy of the Jewish state, it's an opposition to the existence of the Jewish state. I mean, plenty of people have issues with policy, right? So I, I would compare it to a lot of the uh, anti-Semitism we see on the far left, as opposed to uh, the alt-right, which you, you might have a Richard Spencer, Richard Spencer who will talk very openly about how he admires Israel, but that doesn't stop him from, uh, from being virulently anti-Semitic. Well, yeah, um, y yes. I mean, the, the, the Nazi, the neo-Nazi anti-Semite is proud of his anti-Semitism, right? Brags about it. The, 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 the many, at least on the far left, who are seriously opposed to the existence of the Jewish state will just as vehemently deny that there's anything anti-Semitic about it, right? So I think we have time for one final question and it's from uh, Janinia Graves. And she would like you to expound a little further on the concept of racism being an expression of anti-Semitism rather than reverse. And, and include in your answer, why is this concept important to understand from your perspective? Good. I'm, that's an excellent question. I'm so glad uh, you asked. Um, what is the anti-Semite anti? The anti-Semite is, is opposed to the millennial teaching and testimony of the Jewish people that the Jewish people represent by their very presence in the world. Going back to the Torah and among the early, you know, the, the, the first things we're taught in the Torah is the basis of the value of a human being. A human being has value because a human being is created in the image and likeness of the Holy One. Every soul is connected to every other soul through the Creator. And uh, every physical person is connected to every other through Adam. Uh, God begins with one human being and not with two, so that no one can say, my side of the family is better than your side of the family. Uh, so we have a physical and spiritual connection to each other that brings with it uh, really an infinite ethical obligation because the other person is infinitely precious. The anti-Semite is trying to eliminate that responsibility and that connection. Uh, you, you, you can't become a racist without first determining that the, the object of your racism is not quite as human as you are, that you have no essential relation to the object of your racism, right? So, uh, I mean, the, to the, you know, the other ethnic group, the, the ethnic difference, the, the, the difference in color, all of these things become decisive. Uh, whereas from a, a Jewish point of view, what is decisive is that we're all children of Adam. The word for human being is ben adam in Hebrew, which is child of Adam. That's what the anti-Semites trying to obliterate. So you have to obliterate that view in order to arrive at a racist outlook. You got to get rid of the Jewish understanding of our humanity in order to then proceed to a racist position. Uh, the Jewish categories of thinking here preclude racist thinking. So that's why, you know, it's, it's anti-Semitism is not a subset of racism. Okay, racism stems from anti-Semitism, stems from this, this opposition to this, the, this basic Jewish teaching about the infinite dearness of the other human being. Let me, if I can, do I have time for one more point? Sure. Um, one of the, the, the commandment repeated most frequently in the Torah is the commandment to love and care for the stranger, the one who's not like me, which is most inimical to the races. 
I have, why? Because my love and care for the stranger is exactly where, where my soul draws its breath. That is who I am. Um, so uh, the, the stranger includes the non-believer, right? The one who's in the other political party, the one whose hair is different colors, you know, who, who doesn't speak like I speak. The stranger, in other words, is any child of Adam. Uh, this is the most frequent, frequently repeated commandment, the most, one of the most fundamental to Torah. I mean, I can give you examples of rabbis who say it is the, the basis of Torah. Uh, and that has to be eliminated if I'm to embrace a racist ideology. I got to eliminate the Jew. I have to eliminate the witness that opposes me from ancient times, from ancient times. I hope that thank you. Thank you, David. And, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. So appreciative of the collaborative partnership between AJC, the Tulsa Jewish Federation, and the UTD Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies. We'll look forward to seeing everyone again next Thursday evening, October 22nd at 7 p.m., where we will hear from my friend, Dr. Niels Romer. Uh, who will talk about the impact of nationalism on anti-Semitism. I know it will be a very informative and interesting session, and I look forward to seeing you all then. In the meantime, stay safe, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> be safe. Be blessed.